I'm Dr. Charles Eaton. This presentation is for the 2017 Annual Scientific Meeting of the American Society for Surgery of the Hand. I'm going to talk about Dupuytren decision trees. The goal of treating Dupuytren disease is to have the least lifetime morbidity from both Dupuytren and its treatment. This is the decision tree diagram that I'd like to be able to present. The Dupuytren is recognized as a rheumatologic condition. The rheumatologists assess it with a biomarker activity panel, and if the patient doesn't have much uh, current activity, they can have a genetic panel to see what their lifetime risk is to decide whether they need ongoing monitoring. If they have a, a high level of activity according to their biomarker, they can have biomarker guided disease specific medical treatment. All that's done at the, at the rheumatologists and if the person has a deformity then they're referred to the surgeon to have the lowest risk uh, simplest procedure to reduce the deformity and then they're referred back to the rheumatologist. And this is a standard model for chronic diseases, chronic rheumatologic diseases. We get involved with treating the anatomy, but we don't do anything specifically for controlling the biology using our surgical tools. We patch and release. And that's the case in rheumatoid arthritis, gout, Raynaud's disease, and other chronic medical conditions. Because we're surgeons, we don't treat chronic conditions. We treat conditions that have a definitive beginning and end, and we are the vehicle to go from the beginning to the end. And that's unfortunately the way we are currently with Dupuytren disease because there is not yet a medical treatment and so we're the primary caregivers and so we make the assessment not based on a biological uh, perspective but based on the degree of deformity and then we formulate a procedural recommendation based on primarily the degree and type of deformity. We may modify that based on our hunch as far as the biologic situation of the, of the patient, but we provide procedures. The patients recover. Some have complications. Some need treatment for that. Some become stable afterward for a period of time, and some will have a progression or recurrence, and they'll come back and we'll go through the cycle again. And this flow diagram is a standard surgical flow diagram. It has a beginning and on the right side it has an end. And the end, unfortunately, is that the patient avoids coming back to see us. And that's when the cycle stops from our point of view. Of course, it doesn't stop for the patient. And this issue exists because Dupuytren is both biologic and anatomic, but it's biologic first. And we have surgical options to treat the disease, and we use surgical options to try to treat the biology, but we don't do a great job of that. So that's where we currently sit. The long-term outlook for people with Dupuytren disease really depends a lot on their biology. If someone has a mild contracture and a mild biology, they really have a pretty good outlook. If they have a more severe contracture and mild biology, they still have a pretty good outcome because we have great technical tools to treat the deformity of Dupuytren disease. However, if the person has more aggressive biology, even if their contractor isn't that bad, their long-term outlook is not that great. And if someone has bad biology and a bad contracture, they stand a very real risk of failing everything that we have in our quill to throw at them. Textbook treatment uh, is based on similar concepts. If someone has a minimal procedure and a minimal biology, they can have a minimal procedure and they ought to do fairly well. If they have a more severe contracture but uh, have pretty good biology, then we have technical uh, approaches that are um, well established as a way to deal with that. If someone has aggressive biology, then we start uh, performing surgery which is in procedures which are more radical and more destructive to the hand in an effort to control the biology with surgery, which really doesn't work that well. So our decision points, where we are currently, we base our treatment on the deformity, on our assessment of biology, whether we're doing additional procedures, and what the patient's track record is. 
in terms of prior treatment. Putting all things aside, the deformity and the degree of contractures, the most important uh, influence in making decisions, and the breakpoints for uh, choosing what kinds of procedures to do uh, for the PIP joint is around 60 degrees and for a composite contractor around 90 degrees. If you are less than that, the patient will do pretty well with um, with most procedures and so why not do the procedure that has the uh, least morbidity and least risk. People that have contractures that are greater than that, uh, PIP contractures greater than 60 degrees will do better with long-term with a fasciectomy than with a minimally invasive procedure and people who have uh, contractures that are even greater than that that really need some uh, technical approach to the secondary changes that are developed in their hands may need staged or combined procedures to get the best outcome. We make a decision on biology based on clinical risk factors, the diathesis factors, and if someone has several diathesis factors or if somebody has a diathesis-like post-treatment course, and we can guess that it was because of diathesis, then we do procedures to try to change the biology, and that's gold standard is dermofasciectomy. Uh, Up-and-coming procedures are barrier procedures in which either an absorbable, biocompatible uh, sheet of material is put between the skin and the depths of the wound, or a fascia flap between the skin and the depths of the wound. And the concept here is that we're changing the biology. I'm not convinced of that at all. I think that the thing that we know that we're changing is the mechanics of the hand and the sheer strain stress mechanical forces on the soft tissues of the palm with each of these procedures and that may have a secondary effect on provoking the biology. People with Dubuchin disease, particularly because of the demographic, often have multiple diagnoses and trigger fingers, a very common diagnosis to have with Dubuchin. I mention this because uh, I've seen two patients who were operated on by very skilled surgeons who appeared to have over-release of their uh, tendon sheaths with combined fasciectomy and trigger finger releases and had uh, dramatic bowstringing of their flexor tendons at the MP level, uh, which is very difficult to come up with a surgical solution and sometimes impossible. So in the person who's having an open fasciectomy and trigger release, consider that and consider how you might deal with a rheumatoid who has a trigger as well. You try to be conservative because bow stringing uh, can be a, an issue. The stealth diagnosis in someone who has a severe metacarpophalangeal joint contracture is a sagittal band rupture and you can do a sagittal band reconstruction or, uh, or any of these procedures at the same time as doing a, a uh, needle fasciotomy or a open fasciectomy. Uh, it's difficult to make the diagnosis of a sagittal band rupture in somebody who has a fixed MP contracture and one clue is uh, rotation of the finger at the MP level that isn't otherwise explained by cords in their palm. I've done these procedures uh, with uh, all of these procedures with people that uh, were at the same time undergoing uh, procedure for their fasciectomy. You can't do this with collagenase, but you, you can do this with uh, mechanical procedures for Dupuytren. If someone has had uh, prior treatment and they did well and it lasted for a long time, years, and they have a recurrence, then it's a reasonable thing to repeat that same procedure if they were happy with it and if they had a reasonable result. Or consider moving down the reconstructive ladder to something less invasive. If someone didn't do well or had a, a bad result uh, or a rapid recurrence after their prior procedure, consider moving up the ladder. And if you think that it's because they had uh, diathesis type influence, then consider moving up two rungs because the goal is to reduce the lifetime morbidity of Dubuitrin disease from both its 
underlying biology, and our treatment. All of these issues would be very different if we had some quantitative measure of Dupuytren biology. We could intelligently design decision trees for treatment, we could quantify the severity, make better predictions, and most importantly that we could develop disease-specific biologic treatment to put Dupuytren where it belongs, and that is in the hands of the rheumatologists managed as a chronic disease with chronic biologic treatment. Thank you very much.